Thank you. The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill is amended as Stage 2, that is SP Bill 3A, the Marshall List, that is SP Bill 3A-ML, the Groupings, that is SP Bill 3A-G, timed. The Division Bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the First Division of the afternoon. The period of voting on the First Division will be 30 seconds. Members who wish to speak in the debate on the group of amendments to press the qu their request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the Marshall list of amendments. And in Group 1, regulations under Section 10.1, Economic, Environmental and Social Impacts, I'll call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendments 1A, 1B and 1C. Cabinet Secretary, please, to move Amendment 1 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will speak first to Amendment 1. The Scottish Government fully supports and recognises the importance of robust analysis of policies both before and after implementation. With this in mind, I listen carefully to the points raised at the Finance and Constitution Committee at Stage 2. I also gave a commitment to work to see if an amendment on impact assessments could be brought forward at Stage 3, which the Government could support, and which also retained the spirit of Mr Harvey's Stage 2 amendment. Amendment 1 is the result of this work and places two duties on Scottish Ministers in relation to the power in Section 10.1 of the Bill to define tax bans and set tax rate amounts in secondary legislation. The first duty requires Scottish Ministers to have regard to projected economic, environmental and social impacts when preparing draft secondary legislation on tax bans and rate amounts. The second duty requires Scottish Ministers to keep these impacts under review when the tax bans and rate amounts are in force. The Government considers that this amendment is a fair compromise, striking the right balance between the accountability and flexibility of necessary, uh, necessary with tax powers, but it also places a robust set of requirements onto the face of the Bill, which the Government is already on track to meet. Firstly, the Government has already commissioned separate independent economic and noise impact assessments of our overall 50% ADT reduction plan, and these reports will be published by the time Parliament is asked to consider the first set of tax bans and rate amounts in the autumn. Secondly, a strategic environmental assessment is already underway. The next step of the SEA will involve the Government publicly consulting over the summer on our overall 50% ADT reduction plan, as well as an environmental report which will outline the findings of the assessment of the plan against a wide range of environmental topics such as climate factors, air quality, material assets and biodiversity. Thirdly, at the same time as the SEA consultations are launched, the Government will publish an updated greenhouse gas emissions impact assessment of our overall 50% ADT reduction plan. Finally, in addition to the analysis already being carried out, the Government has asked the contractor undertaking the independent economic assessment to consider the best way to design a robust monitoring and evaluation framework so that this can be put in place for assessing the economic, environmental and social impacts of ADT in the future. I will now turn to the three amendments lodged by Andy Whiteman. The Government does not support these for the following reasons. Firstly, on amendments 1A and 1B, in response to the points made by Patrick Harvey at Stage 2, the amendment lodged by the Government already requires Scottish Ministers to have regard to the environmental impacts of tax bans and tax rate amounts. This would include consideration of the impact on greenhouse gas emissions. The Government therefore does not think it is necessary or appropriate to place a further duty on Scottish Ministers on the face of the Bill. Secondly, Amendment 1C would restrict the Government's flexibility to respond at short notice to make changes to the tax by requiring a detailed set of very prescriptive assessments to be completed every time before secondary legislation for tax bans and rate amounts can be laid before Parliament. The Scottish Parliament did not consider this necessary for the other devolved taxes, land and building transaction tax, Scottish landfill tax, and it is not something required for any UK tax. Neither, in the Government's view, is it necessary for ADT. 
Scottish ministers will, of course, have regard for the economic, environmental and social impacts of changes to tax bans and rate amounts. And Amendment 1, lodged by the Government, places a duty on Scottish ministers to do so. But the Scottish Government believes that placing a requirement to publish assessments on the face of the bill would be overly prescriptive and is not necessary. In conclusion, presiding officer, I therefore move Amendment 1 and invite the Parliament to reject Amendments 1A, 1B and 1C. Thank you. I call Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 1A and speak to the other amendments in the group. Mr Whiteman, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, my amendments in this group are designed to add some policy purpose to an air departure tax in Scotland, to ensure that evidence informs ADT rates decisions, and to add some safeguards against any Scottish ministers of any government who want Parliament to give them the power to reduce taxes from an already extraordinarily lightly taxed industry. Um, Amendment 1A uh, is required as part of 1B. Amendment 1B is the first of my substantive amendments, and it follows on, as the Cabinet Secretary indicated, from discussions at Stage 2 with Patrick Harvey, um, who argued uh, that APD rates and bans uh, should be set in order to deliver a fiscal policy for aviation based on targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions. Witnesses to the committee from the avi aviation industry say they can reduce aviation uh, emissions, um, but science and international treaties say we must. And I don't recall the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 2 disagreeing with the principle of requiring ADT to deliver an emissions reduction strategy. But if he does disagree, he can, perhaps he can tell the Chamber this afternoon. The issue he identified as problematic was that setting a target specific to aviation emissions would, in his view, be inflexible and challenge, quote, the whole economy approach in Scotland's current climate change legislation. And in response, therefore, I proposed Amendment 1B which takes account of the Minister's comments and no longer requires a specific aviation target. Instead, in setting rates and bans of ADT, Ministers must act in a way best calculated to deliver on Scotland's climate targets as a whole. The second half of Amendment 1B refers to the Government's purpose targets, and these are the measures the Government has set to judge its own success by, as set out in the National Performance Framework. Now, sustainability measured by reducing climate emissions is one, so is reducing income inequality. Increasing so-called sustainable economic growth is another, even though the government's never given a satisfactory definition of this contradictory term. Now, the government has argued that its proposed policy for ADT will increase economic growth, though that was exposed as an evidence-free assertion by the Finance Committee. Now, what ministers have been less keen to talk about is who benefits from cutting taxes on aviation. ADP is a fiscally progressive tax, mostly paid by corporations, visiting tourists and the wealthier members of society who fly very frequently. Cutting it is regressive and socially unjust. My Amendment 1B would require ministers to start considering not just growth, but quality of life and inequalities. And for the purpose of, for the avoidance of doubt, I do not oppose the government's amendment. It requires ministers to think about broader things like environment and social impacts, to have regard to them, but what it does not do is require them to mandate them to act positively and make choices that will protect the environment and enhance social justice. The government amendment as it stands will allow ministers of any colour at any time in the future to act lawfully should they decide to set tax rates that increase pollution and gave even bigger tax giveaways to the wealthiest. My amendment constrains any government of whatever political persuasion from doing that. Amendment 1C is a requirement to end the evidence-free vacuum within which someone in the SNP at some time decided it would be a clever thing to cut aviation taxes in half. The amendment requires an assessment of emissions and noise and air pollution for communities around uh, airports, something my constituents in North West Edinburgh experience every day, and it requires information to help Parliament and others decide if the tax change is progressive or regressive. Does it benefit the already wealthy or not? Now, Amendment C does not ask for a tax forecast because I've taken the Minister's comments at stage two about the forecasting role of the Fiscal Commission into account. So instead of just requiring ministers to think about certain things, as the Government Amendment proposes, and the Cabinet Secretary says that his Amendment 1 um, already deals with these things, but of course it only requires ministers to have regard um, to, 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 to these matters, and the Minister also criticised Amendment 1C as being too rigid uh, and being something that would have to be produced in response to every rate um, uh, uh, change. Um, this is just an assessment. The framework for that assessment can be, can be uh, permanent, um, but the information underpinning that should be readily available. It should not be an onerous task. 
So instead of requiring ministers just to think about things, requirement 1C would require ministers to think about them alongside evidence and provide this parliament with the information it needs to properly scrutinise proposals on rates and bans. Presenting officer, I'd like to say a lot more about the extraordinary under-taxation of the aviation industry, question who really owns Edinburgh Airport, who will benefit from tax cuts, etc. But I'll leave that for another day and remain focused on the bill and the amendments I have tabled, which will do as much as possible to ensure that this new tax power is used responsibly with behaviour changes and impacts firmly in, kind, in mind. I move Amendment 1A and urge MSPs to vote with all the amendments in this group. Uh, thank you, Mr White. May we open debate. I call Murdo Fraser, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd just like to make a brief contribution in relation to the amendments uh, in this group that are uh, before us. Uh, the uh, Finance and Constitution Committee, as we've already heard in the course of this debate, did uh, recommend that when uh, bringing forward the setting of uh, rates and bans, the, the Scottish Government needed to address the issue of an evidence base behind that. And therefore, I welcome uh, Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, which I think uh, helpfully responds to that a particular point uh, and, and looks at this whole question of the economic, environmental and social impacts uh, that the setting of the rates and bans will have, as the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged in his comments uh, earlier. So I think that's a welcome amendment that we're happy to support. In relation to the three amendments in the name of Andy Whiteman, I understand where uh, Mr Whiteman is coming from on behalf of the Green Party in relation to these. Uh, my concern is that these are, are too prescriptive, they put too many obligations uh, on ministers which might be difficult uh, to meet, particularly in a short time frame where uh, rates and bans have to be adjusted perhaps in response to economic conditions. And I recognise, as the Cabinet Secretary said, there might be a need for greater flexibility than these amendments would require. I also wonder whether these... Um, uh, yes, happily. Yeah. Patrick Harvey. Uh, Murdo Fraser, I'm, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. He, he indicates that it might be a scenario in the future that a decision on rates and bans needs to be taken quickly. But surely, even in an urgent situation or perceived urgent situation, such a decision couldn't be made in the absence of evidence, an absence of an analysis of the factors that set out in, in the Green Amendment. If that information is available on which to base a decision, surely it can be published. Murdo Fraser. Well, I thank Mr Harvey for that amendment, but I do think his concerns are addressed by the Cabinet Secretary's own amendment, one, which uh, does say the Minister must have regard to these aspects before they set taxes and bans. But there is a second point, which, with respect to Mr Whiteman, he didn't address in his uh, contribution when proposing his own amendments, and that is that when tax and bans are proposed by ministers, they have to bring them to this Parliament for a vote. And therefore, members of this Parliament are not satisfied that uh, the evidence has been presented in support of the setting of these taxes and bans. They can reject them. They can send them back again. Uh, therefore, members of this Parliament are quite entitled to be able to justify and consider that at that point. If I have time, I'll give away again. Yes, we have in this particular one. Yeah. Andy White. Yeah. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you, uh, Murdo Fraser, for giving way. Um, but when these proposals for rates and bans come to Parliament for us to decide upon them, we will be unable to do that effectively and in an informed fashion if they are not accompanied by an analysis of the social, economic and economic impacts of them. Ministers are only required to have regard to those factors when setting the rates, so surely Parliament needs a fuller analysis and fuller information to properly do its job. Murdo Fraser. Well, I, I would say in response to Mr Whiteman that if members of Parliament are not satisfied that the evidence is there in support of the setting of taxes and bans, they can reject the proposal to set taxes and bans and send them back to the government to think again. It seems to me entirely sensible. And unlike Mr Whiteman, I have more faith in the ability of members of this parliament to consider these matters properly at the time that such rates and bans are proposed. And for that reason, we'll be happy to support uh, the amendment in name of the Cabinet Secretary, but we cannot support the amendments in name of Mr Whiteman. Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I speak in favour of all the amendments in this group. Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and in particular Amendments 1A, 1B and 1C in the name of Andy Whiteman. These amendments are important because many of those who contributed both to the Scottish Government's consultation and Finance Committee's evidence on the bill expressed real concern about the impact a significant tax reduction could have. They expressed concern about the environmental impact of reducing the tax burden on the aviation industry and concern too about the implications a loss of revenue could have on public finances. Indeed, a majority of those who participated in the Scottish Government's 
own consultation oppose the very course of action that ministers are committing to, effectively cutting air passenger duty in half with a view to abolishing it, the tax altogether. I want to explain how these amendments could partially address some of these concerns that have been expressed. The Finance Committee heard from Transform Scotland and other campaigners that aviation is already one of the most lightly taxed industries in the world and further tax reductions would increase aviation emissions. We heard that a tax reduction could reduce government revenue by up to £189 million a year and would do so when public services are already under severe pressure. As Andy Whiteman has said, we heard that those who are frequent flyers, who are the wealthiest and, or who are on higher incomes, would benefit disproportionately. There was also considerable doubt as to whether a tax cut would actually boost or benefit the economy in any meaningful way. The Chamber should know that no credible evidence has been presented to the Finance Committee, for example, to suggest that the growth passenger numbers in Ireland had anything to do with the abolition of the equivalent departure taxes. Here in Scotland, airports are already reporting record growth in passenger numbers, and all of that growth, all of that success has occurred within existing levels of air passenger duty. The case for the government's tax cut is not stacking up. It would therefore seem reasonable to require that ministers set out exactly what the impact of their plans would be before they can proceed with any changes to rates or bans. At all times, we believe they should have due regard for economic, environmental and social impact of their proposals. That is why we, we do support Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. But let us be clear, however, that having due regard for the impact of new tax rates is the bare minimum we should expect from the Scottish Government. We can and we should go further. Amendments 1A, 1B and 1C in the name of Andy Maitman requires ministers to produce an assessment outlining the projected economic, environment and social impacts of proposed new tax bans and tax rates amounts. Essentially, Scottish ministers would have to provide evidence to justify the rates and bans they choose to apply. This amendment places a reasonable duty on ministers requiring them to do just that. Given the direction of government policy regarding air departure tax, Scottish Labour chooses to support these amendments. James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I rise particularly to press support for the Andy Whiteman amendments. Um, the Cabinet Secretary said that he listened carefully to the debate and the representations made at stage two, and he brought forward his amendment one in response to that. And that, that is welcome because it is a move in the right direction. Uh, however, the amendment is you know, just a bit kind of waffly, I feel. Um, I mean, it says that Scottish ministers must have regard to the proposed economic, environmental and social <coughs> impacts uh, of the proposed tax bans and tax rate amounts. I mean, you get the impression of the Cabinet Secretary, you know, giving regard to these uh, matters, you know, sitting in his ministerial office, asking one of his aides to get their binoculars out, and have a look over to Edinburgh Airport to see what's happening um, and saying, well, there's plenty of planes going in and out. There looks to be lots of people going in and out. So it's all, it's all going absolutely fine. Um, but that, you know, I actually think that the Andy Whiteman amendments would strengthen this considerably because of the fundamental issues uh, at debate here. You know, the government are going to use this power to reduce the ADT, and they want to do so, uh, make, asking us to believe that it won't have an adverse effect on carbon emissions, it won't adversely affect uh, the Scottish budget, um, and that it is also fair. Um, and I think we have serious concerns about that, and therefore Andy Whiteman's proposals that there be a proper assessment, and that assessment is published, and we therefore can see the evidence that a cut an ADT would have on emissions, would have on the Scottish budget, and would have on people on different uh, income uh, deciles uh, would be crucial in making the Parliament making a decision as to whether any such cut is appropriate. So therefore, uh, and I ask the Cabinet Secretary, even at this late stage, to look at accepting the Andy Whiteman's amendments, because that would not only strengthen his bill, but it would strengthen the process of parliamentary scrutiny going forward. Thank you. As no other member is asked to speak, I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up on Amendment 1, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I suppose I could begin from where James Kelly left off and what is described as a waffly move in the right direction. I suppose that's high praise from James <laughs> Kelly 
Uh, indeed, actually, the commissioning and the work that I've agreed to, to undertake is far more robust than you would uh, suggest. I'm sure it's not out of, of ignorance that James Kelly or, or Neil Bibby um, are ignoring the fact that I've actually agreed to publish a range uh, of work in view of uh, earlier uh, deliberations at the Finance and Constitution uh, Committee. So that will absolutely be published. But what some of these amendments are about in part is making that our legislative duty on the face of the bill to be published every time the government wants to make a proposal uh, around rates and bans. But Murdo Fraser is correct, yes. Patrick Harvey. Is the Cabinet Secretary uh, any more able than he was at stage two to tell us why on earth he feels able to adopt a policy already on how he wants to use this tax, halving it and then scrapping it? How can he adopt that policy before he's conducted any of these economic analyses that he's now intending to commission? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what Patrick Harvey is specifically asking about is the question that, you know, he fairly put to me, and Andy Whiteman has asked the same question, what independent Scottish Government commissioned analysis was undertaken? Now, there is a range of evidence in terms of this policy and this position, but I was fairly asked what independent analysis had been commissioned by the Government, and that's what is being undertaken. What my amendment proposes to do is to look at our powers uh, responsibly, to place a duty on ministers to consider all those burdens and all those considerations in making a proposition and a proposal around tax rates and bans. But work has been commissioned. I think that has to be recognised. That will be published. And that will be published uh, in advance of Parliament being asked through affirmative order uh, to make a decision on rates and bans. And that is in keeping uh, with other currently devolved taxes, I would argue that it goes further, and that includes climate consideration and environmental considerations as well. So I understand from Mr Harvey and Mr Whiteman uh, their concerns uh, around this issue, uh, but I have looked at you know, who sponsors the evidence, so commissioned independent government analysis, looked at the environmental concerns, will publish those reports and consultations, and in view of all of that, I think this, uh, those additional amendments are too prescriptive and therefore unnecessary. And I'll certainly uh, push ahead with the amendment that I have lodged. Thank you. I call Andy Whiteman to wind up an amendment in one, 1A one and press or withdraw, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, air departure tax is a modest tax on a very, very lightly taxed industry. The effective tax subsidy for the UK aviation sector in 2012 was around £11.4 billion. That's that's no tax on jet fuel, zero rated uh, for VAT, etc. That's over £400 uh, per household. With fares falling, flights growing, pollution increasing, there is no need to cut this tax. But we do have to have a legislative framework within which to set the tax, and that's what this bill uh, does. <coughs> Ministers must make the proposals that they intend to bring to this Parliament about rates, must make them informed fully by climate change targets and informed by firm evidence. Yes, uh, these amendments place a statutory duty to do very certain things. Uh, ministers should welcome uh, these tests. Um, I am very concerned that this act, uh, that with this act, the, government, uh, is approach, the government's approach to this act is informed by its predetermined policy to cut tax rather than to consider carefully how to design a tax for an industry that's already one of the biggest threats to the planet. Now, I welcome the assessments that the minister has said that he will table. However, these are not a statutory duty. The statutory duty on ministers is, and I quote, to have regard to the projected economic, environmental and social impacts and to keep these impacts under review. There is no statutory duty even to publish those uh, assessments. Under our amendments, there would be a statutory duty both to act in a way that best calculated to uh, meet the uh, carbon emission reduction targets set out in part one of the Climate Change Act, to set out to, to, to meet the purpose targets set out in the National Performance Framework, and to publish an assessment. This is fairly modest. Presiding officer, uh, I press amendments 1A, 1B and 1C in my name. We're only required to press 1A currently. Stop. 
Press 1A. Thank you very much. The question is, Amendment 1A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed there will be a division, as this is the first division at this stage. I suspend for five minutes.
We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 1A. This is a 30-second division. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote amendment number 1A in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 29, no, 86. There are no abstentions. The amendment was therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 1B in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 1. Mr Whiteman, to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 1B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. The result of the vote, amendment number 1B in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 30, no, 85, there are no abstentions. This amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 1C in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 1. Mr Whiteman, to move or not move? Moved. The question is, amendment 1C be agreed to, are we all agreed? Oh. We are not agreed, there will be a division. The result of the vote amendment number 1C in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 30, no, 87, there are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call the Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw amendment 1. Moved. Just press or withdraw, you've already yes, moved sorry. it. Thank you. The question is that amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That ends consideration of amendments. But before you go, because there's a because there's a procedural change, I'm going to read this out to you and it'll be repeated later. As members will be aware, at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is now required, under standing order, to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to protected subject matter. Put briefly, that is whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. If it does, the motion to pass the bill will require support from a supermajority of members, that is, a two-thirds majority of all members, which is 86. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided, in his view, no provision of the Air Depar Departure Tax Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. I know that's all embedded in your memory now. Thank you. on to the debate on the bill.
can I ask members leaving the chamber to do so quietly. The next item of business is a debate on motion 6164 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill at stage three. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Derek Mackay to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, eight minutes or thereabouts. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open this stage three debate on the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. The establishment of ADT is another important milestone on the journey to enhance Scotland's fiscal powers and another example of this government continuing to move ahead with pace and purpose in order to ensure we are ready to begin using Scotland's new powers once they are devolved to the Scottish Parliament. I would like to thank both the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the Bill. Uh, that input has helped to shape the bill before Parliament today, which now includes tax exemptions brought forward by the government at stage two. It can also be seen in the independent economic assessment in which the government has commissioned to help inform our secondary legislation plans for tax bans and rate amounts. I would also like to thank those organisations and individuals who have contributed to the policy development for ADT both before and after the bill was introduced to Parliament. And with the other currently devolved taxes, the Scottish Government has taken, and will continue to take, a consultative and collaborative approach to engaging stakeholders on how ADT should be structured and operated. The Scottish Government is seeking Parliament's approval today to the bill. This establishes the general structure and operation of ADT, a tax to be charged on the carriage of passengers on flights that begin in Scotland. The tax will apply only for the carriage of chargeable passengers on chargeable aircraft and will be payable by the aircraft operator. With the core foundations of the tax in place, we will then bring forward our tax bans and rate amounts proposals in secondary legislation this autumn. This secondary legislation will be subject to the affirmative procedure, meaning it cannot come into effect without Parliament's approval. This is consistent with the approach taken for the other devolved taxes. Under terms agreed between the Scottish and UK governments in the fiscal framework, air passenger duty will cease to apply in Scotland from the 1st of April 2018. The block grant will be adjusted downwards, and if this bill is enacted, ADT will replace it from that date. Revenue Scotland continues to make good progress to be ready to collect and manage ADT from April 2018, and do, as does the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which will be responsible for producing independent forecasts of receipts from ADT for future Scottish Government budgets. These forecasts will reflect the Scottish Government's policy for ADT at that time. Scotland is already an attractive destination for business and inbound tourism. But it is important, particularly given the economic threat posed by Brexit, that we continue to be open to key and emerging markets in order to further capitalise on the opportunities that exist. As has been discussed, the Scottish Government's plans for ADT, a 50% reduction in the overall tax burden by the end of this parliamentary session and abolishing the tax when resources allow, are a key part of the Government's economic strategy, in particular boosting trade, investment, influence and networks. Scotland's airports are competing on a world stage to secure new routes and capacity. Reducing the tax burden helps ensure a more level playing field with many other European airports competing to secure the same airlines and similar routes. I yes, I will. Patrick Harvey. The Cabinet Secretary is being very clear that uh, way in advance of having the information or the assessments that he said he wants to commission, he remains committed to the policy of halving and then ultimately scrapping uh, this source of revenue. What is the SNP's view about how that gap should be filled? Should it come from increasing other taxes, which we could do now? Should it come from cutting public services even deeper, which the government could propose to do now? Uh, why is it he's legislating to create a tax that he thinks should not exist? Cabinet Secretary. Well, today, of course, is not about tax rate and bans, where we'll have that discussion about how the powers that we're proposing to establish today are actually used. And we have um, set out a policy based on our view around enhanced connectivity, 
uh, enhanced economic uh, growth and that that would support the economic drivers of the Scottish economy uh, in which airports uh, and airlines are, are clearly uh, central uh, in that. New routes will enhance business connectivity and tourism as well as providing new jobs. Now, the Scottish Government agrees with others in this chamber that it is important that our plans for ADT are supported by robust evidence and that the impacts are monitored over time. And that is why I set out earlier in the debate on amendments, we are undertaking a broad range of impact assessments. And these will be published by the time Parliament is asked to consider our secondary legislation proposals for tax bans and rate amounts in the autumn. And it is also why this Government brought forward an amendment at Stage 3 uh, now uh, that Parliament has passed. It places statutory duties on ministers to have regard to the projected economic, environmental and social impacts of our plans for tax bans and rate amounts, and to keep these under review when the tax bans and tax rate amounts are in force. Now, the government recognises that boosting economic growth by improving air connectivity may lead to an increase in aviation emissions. And this should be in the context, however, of Scotland making sustained progress to its statutory emissions reduction targets, which are set across the economy as a whole. We are prepared to work harder in other areas to meet climate change targets. And we should acknowledge, too, that airlines, aircraft manufacturers and engine manufacturers are doing a great deal to reduce emissions through improvements in technology. In conclusion, taken together... Yes, I will. Claudia Beamish. Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. And um, would the Cabinet Secretary not agree with me that in view of the, the fact that uh, transport is now the highest emitter of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that it is extraordinary that um, uh, this should be the Scottish Government position? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, our, our statutory advisers in the UK uh, Committee on Climate Change has suggested that even modelling in our policy proposition around a tax reduction, and if that has the, the outcome of increased emissions, that's still, in their words, manageable, so manageable in terms of the climate uh, agenda. And of course, this government has a strong track record in uh, meeting uh, our targets. And we believe uh, that that can be managed by working harder uh, in other areas. In conclusion, taken together, the provisions in the bill provide the basis for a tax that is well understood by taxpayers and is efficient to collect and manage. There is general support from stakeholders, and I hope in this chamber, to the bill and the establishment of a tax to replace APD in Scotland. And I do appreciate that there remains a range of views about the detail of the tax, including rates and bans, and how any tax reduction should be applied to maximise the economic benefit for Scotland. But the government remains of the view that our approach, whereby the overall burden of the tax is reduced by 50% by the end of this session of Parliament, and the tax is abolished when resources allow, will deliver strong economic benefits for Scotland. And I look forward to debating these and other issues this afternoon. But today we're not debating that policy, but we're debating the ability to collect this tax in Scotland as a consequence of the negotiations which have led to the devolution of this tax to Scotland. So I move that the Parliament approves the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. Thank you. I call Murdo Fraser. Six minutes or thereabouts, Mr Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can, can I start by welcoming the fact that uh, this Parliament is finally going to peace, pass a piece of law, nearly 14 months on after the Scottish Parliament election last year. For this is, apart from the, the Budget Bill, which of course was a, a legal necessity, the first piece of substantial legislation that will be completed uh, in this Parliament in all that time. Now, we're at the stage in the parliamentary process of the bill where veterans of uh, stage three debates will know there's very little new to say. Where a bill has been substantially amended at stages two or three, there might well be new issues to introduce. But uh, as in this case, where that does not apply, we are effectively rerunning the arguments we had uh, in committee and in the stage uh, one debate. And of course, at that point, this bill did achieve very substantial support across the parliament. And I think it's important to, to reiterate the point that the Cabinet Secretary has just made. If this bill is not passed, then all that will happen is that the Scottish Government will not be able to collect any taxes on air travel. I do not think there's any party in this Parliament who thinks that is a sensible outcome. And therefore, I hope the whole Parliament will vote for this bill at decision time this evening. Um, yes, indeed. Andy Whiteman. Uh, if this bill is not passed and the Government's not 
able to collect any revenue, that'll be no different in outcome from passing the bill and eventually setting the rate at zero. Well, it's an interesting intervention from Mr Whiteman. To be, to be fair to the Cabinet Secretary, I don't think even he is proposing, starting from next year with collecting no revenue at all from air uh, departure tax. I think he might, he might have an ambition to get there in the end, but I don't think he has that ambition in the short term. So I think we can all agree that this bill surely uh, is desired. So what this bill does is uh, reintroduce what is in effect the existing framework uh, in place at UK level for air passenger duty, but giving it a new title air departure tax, but in other respects, effectively the same uh, tax that was there before, an approach which was uh, widely uh, welcomed by stakeholders across the board, including the airlines and their management companies, who did not want to see an entirely new tax structure being uh, introduced. There have been some changes to the bill made at stages two and three. My colleague Adam Tompkins raised at stage one the question of the scope of the tax, because it is the norm in tax legislation across the UK that the scope of taxation is provided for in primary enactments. And this is distinct from the setting of rates and bans, which is normally left to secondary legislation. And as it was introduced, this bill failed to meet that norm in that it did not stipulate the exemptions to the definitions of chargeable passengers or aircraft. And I was pleased to see that at stage two, the Scottish Government amended the bill to cure it of this defect. So it does now stipulate the relevant exemptions. The one exception to this was the Highlands and Islands situation, where I appreciate there are still unresolved questions around EU state aid rules, which require to be clarified. But the bill as amended is now in tune with not just UK tax legislation, but also other devolved taxes, such as the lands and buildings transaction tax. I hope that the precedent has now been established and all future tax legislation introduced will fully address this question of the scope of taxation when it's uh, originally uh, drafted. Now, we did look at amendments today uh, in relation to the question of evidence required when setting uh, rates uh, and bans. I'm pleased to see that the recommendations of the Finance and Constitution Committee have been uh, accepted by the government and now supported by this parliament. So we will need to see evidence being brought forward uh, when the detail of rates and bans are voted upon uh, by this parliament. And as we heard from the Cabinet Secretary, the next stage in this process will be uh, in the autumn when we hear from the Scottish Government what their detailed proposals are and the evidence that will support them and the impacts these will have uh, on the environment and on the economy. Uh, and the hope is that any proposals will be enacted in the next financial year. Uh, our own view, Deputy Presiding Officer, that we've set out on previous occasions is that we support the ambition of an overall 50% reduction in ADT rates, but our preference would be to see this targeted on long-haul flights rather than the introduction across the board. And there are two advantages uh, to this approach. Firstly, it is our view that there would be a greater economic benefit from reducing the tax on long haul. Because the evidence shows that those traveling long haul tend to stay in Scotland longer than those traveling short haul and tend to spend more money while they are here. And in addition, there is the opportunity if we cut the cost of long haul of attracting more long haul operators to base themselves in Scotland thus reducing the need for Scottish passengers to make connecting flights to hub airports in places like Heathrow or Amsterdam. But there's a second advantage to cutting long haul as opposed to short haul, and that is the environmental argument. In the evidence, the committee heard from Virgin Trains, amongst others, who had a real concern that a reduction in ADT on short haul flights would encourage modal shift away from surface travel, such as cross-border rail between Scotland and London, towards the airlines. And this would not be helpful in terms of us helping meet our climate change targets. But interestingly, Virgin Rail were not opposed to a reduction in long haul ADT. Indeed, they believed that this might encourage more visitors into the UK and would be complementary to them using the rail network once they were here. So our preference is for any reduction in ADT to be targeted at long haul. And I hope that when the Scottish Government is looking at the evidence base for its proposals, it will consider the relative merits of reducing long haul as against short haul as against a cut across the board so we can weigh all these things in the balance. Presiding officer, I think I've said all I can say on this particular piece of legislation and I look forward to supporting it at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. I call Neil Bibby. Mr Bibby, five minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, President officer. <coughs> President officer. The power to charge tax on air passengers leaving Sc Scottish airports 
will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. It is there in the Smith Commission report. It was agreed by all parties. It should not be in any doubt today. Power over what we know, now call air passenger duty is coming to Scotland, but it is a power we must use responsibly. As I have said throughout this process, Scottish Labour support this bill in principle. We believe that the air departure tax should be switched on when air passenger duty is switched off in Scotland next year. However, what we will not support is the approach to the new tax which this Scottish Government have set out. We will not support a tax reduction for which no compelling case has been made, a tax reduction that is unnecessary and irresponsible. We have argued consistently that a 50% cut to air passenger duty, and that is in effect the position of the SNP, will not make Scotland any greener or any fairer. Analysis from the Office for National Statistics shows that having APD would save the top 20% of earners £73, whilst the poorest would save just £4.50. 70% 50. 70 of all flights in the UK are taken by the wealthiest 15% of the population. This is a tax cut for the wealthy frequent flying few, not the many who do not fly or may only fly once a year. Throughout this debate, this, the silence from the SNP on the distributional impact of their plans for the new air departure tax rates has been telling, and they have to confront the environment impact of any tax cut too. I remind the Cabinet Secretary that his own government is projecting an increase in aviation emissions if air departure tax is cut. Transport, as we know, is now the largest source of carbon emissions in Scotland. If the Scottish Government does not properly address transport emissions, and that must include aviation, then it is hard to see how it will meet its obligations under the Climate Change Act. And as it stands, rail travel, a much more environmentally sustainable mode of transport, will lose out in favour of subsidising aviation. Presiding officer, this is the wrong move at the wrong time, and there is no economic imperative for it. Barely a month goes by without Scottish airports recording record growth, passenger numbers up and new routes opening up to new destinations. Week after week in this chamber, we see MSPs submitting motions, rightly applauding the growth of airports and at the same time undermining the government's own case. Edinburgh Airport reported an 11% increase in passenger numbers last year. Glasgow Airport reported their busiest May on record last week. Aberdeen Airport say domestic and international passenger numbers are up. And with duty-free shopping, no VAT on tickets, uh, no fuel duties for airlines, the aviation industry is already one of the most light, lightly taxed industries in the world. The economic case for this tax cut simply does not stack up. I saw the Cabinet Secretary was at Glasgow Airport this morning, and I have to say to the Cabinet Secretary, if he's so concerned at the cost of travelling through Scotland's airports, then why has he said nothing about Glasgow Airport's uh, money-making drop-off charge? Uh, by his silence on this issue, it appears that Mr Mackay has chosen to side with the aviation industry over his own constituents and nearly 15,000 people who have signed a petition objecting to that air uh, drop-off charge. Presiding officer, what is most concerning about the government's approach to APD is that this is a completely unnecessary tax break for the av aviation industry, a tax break of up to £189 million a year will come at the expense of public services and expenditure elsewhere. The SNP cannot tell us, or will not tell us, what they will cut to make up for the revenue they will lose. Will it be the NHS, the bus pass, fire services, the police? Will it be their defining priority of education? Where is the axe going to fall of this £189 million? And what happens if, have, having effectively cut or even abolished their passenger duty, the Scottish Government find out that some other part of the UK decides to follow? This week, uh, the Shadow Chancellor John Macdonald has written to the Chancellor Philip Hammond asking whether abolishing APD in Northern Ireland will form part of a Tory DUP deal. We warned the Government that using air departure tax to cut these rates would trigger a race to the bottom. A race in which public services will lose out and only business interests in the aviation industry can ever win. And so the SNP find themselves in this position, siding with big business, siding with the Tories, siding with Arlene Foster and the DUP to make unnecessary and irresponsible tax cuts, which are bound to hit already overstretched budgets for public services. Scottish Labour, on the other hand, supports air departure tax bill because unlike the SNP, we actually support an air departure tax. We know that we need to put a legislative framework for that new tax in place now. But given the level of concern about Scottish Government's wider approach to APD, we also believe that the Government must fully assess 
the economic, the environmental and the social impact of any changes to tax rates and tax cuts, especially if they persist with tax cuts. Tax reductions of this kind they are proposing will have consequences and the Scottish Government should be honest about what those consequences are. And so, President Officer, Scottish Labour backs the tax, not the cut, and that's why we will vote for this bill. Now move on to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in this important debate in Stage 3 in the Air Departure Tax Bill. At the outset, let me remind colleagues that when it comes to decision time today, what in essence we're being asked to approve is an enabling bill. An enabling bill to give the Scottish Government the authority to levy a tax on the carriage of passengers that depart from Scottish airports. Without this bill, or something very similar to it, once air pa passenger duty is disapplied in Scotland as a result of the Scotland Act 2012, with effect from April 2018, there will be no legal basis for levying any such tax without appropriate legislation being in place. This bill is categorically not about the Scottish Government's stated policy intention of delivering a 50% reduction in the overall burden of ADT by the end of this Parliament. Although, no doubt, as we already have heard, we'll hear a bit more about that during this debate today. That being said, the committee in its Stage 1 report into the Air Departure Tax Bill supported the introduction of legislation to ensure that a tax upon the carriage of air passengers from Scottish airports can be levied. Indeed, it's true to say that by far the majority of respondents to the committee's call for evidence, as well as those who provided evidence in person, supported the principles behind the bill. At the Finance Committee on the 22nd of February, when I asked both Chris Day from Transform Scotland and Mike Robinson from Stop Climate Chaos whether they supported the need for such a bill, both confirmed that they indeed did so. President Officer, I believe the bill was improved by amendments brought forward by the Government in response to the recommendations from both the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Delegated Powers Law Reform Committee. The Committee's recommendation that the Government bring forward amendments at Stage 2 to make detailed provisions for the exemption of chargeable passengers and chargeable aircraft. I believe the Cabinet Secretary deserves some credit for responding so positively on this matter and others that the Committee raised with him. The Committee also brought forward amendments for, for, for the Stage 3 process today so the Government brought them forward in response to concerns raised by Patrick Harvey. And these uh, amendments were passed unanimously earlier today, and they will ensure uh, that in preparing draft regulations, ministers must have regard to the projected economic, environmental and social impacts of the proposed tax bans and rate amounts. And additionally, ministers must also keep these under review. Now, these changes might not have gone as far as the Green Party may have wished, but any reasonable person would judge that the Government have come a long way in this regard. I consider the, that the Government has struck the right balance here in respond, responding to legitimate concerns. As a result, I am strongly of the view the Bill is now fit, fully fit for the purpose that the Government intends. Now, much has already made, comments already been made as a side issue about the Scottish Government's longer-term policy to deliver a 50 per cent reduction in the overall burden of air departure tax by the end of this Parliament. And I believe that the most Andy, yeah. Andy Whiteman. Thank the member for giving it. Does the member accept that there are circumstances in which that 50 per cent reduction may, following the government's stated intention to publish environmental, economic and social uh, assessments, may in fact turn out not to be possible? Bruce Crawford. I've listened to a lot of what the Green Party have said in this regard over the last while in terms of at the committee and also in debate today. You know, if there was a prize for naval gazing, for nitpicking and dancing in the head of a pin all at once, if that was at all possible, then the Greens would be the first up to get that prize today. I have absolutely no doubt about that. Because if, if this bill wasn't here, you'd be asking us to bring one forward, demanding that we had one. So, so it's quite ridiculous your position. But I also presume, obviously, believe in conclusion that the most compelling reason to support the Scottish Government's policy direction is the Tory Government's full throttle advance on hard Brexit cliff edge, putting Scotland's economy at risk and threatening many thousands of jobs. In my constituency of Stirling, 
where the tourism industry supports 5,800 jobs, or 13 per cent of the total number of jobs. It can be no surprise to anyone that I regard the position of the government in this regard as being right. Now is the time, more than any other time, to send a signal that Scotland is open for business, and we will do what we can to help boost the economy using all the powers that we have at our disposal. I have Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Deputy Presiding Officer, last week I took part in the debate on opportunities for growth in the Scottish economy. As I said then, the Scottish Government now has a number of tools at its disposal to facilitate growth in our economy, and that it could be doing more both now and in the future to build trade and investment relationships with countries around the world, not just in Europe. As we discuss stage three of the air departure tax bill, replacing the UK-wide air passenger duty, this is one such economic lever that the Scottish Government can use in order to foster those deeper relationships. We have some of the highest taxes on flying in the world here. So we have an opportunity here to take a different approach, to take Scotland on a path which will ensure we have a competitive tax rate that will encourage airliners, businesses and tourists to come to Scotland, as well as making it cheaper for our own businesses and people to build those deeper relationships with the rest of the world as they go. We as Scottish Conservatives support the devolution of this tax to the Scottish Parliament. It is perhaps around the practical application of the bill in terms of the bans and rates that we may differ from the government. The Scottish Government has, of course, made clear what its intentions are regarding those rates. Um, it wants to cut the tax by 50% and look to scrap it altogether in the longer term. The Scottish Conservatives have consulted, as we've heard widely with stakeholders, on how best to use this opportunity and to target it where it will have the most effect. We have done this within the context of needing to reach out to the world in a post-EU membership climate. As such, our approach is tailored to differentiate between shorter and longer haul flights. So as well as having a progressive system, this will encourage reduced rate and standard rate customers to travel. In practice, the Scottish Conservatives are seeking to lay out a policy which should incentivize new air links from Scotland to global destinations, giving greater choice for worldwide air travel to those less able to afford higher fares. And that includes our smaller and medium-sized businesses who have so much to offer the world but need the assistance from government that this policy can provide. It is also a policy that would ensure consumers continue to have a choice as to how to travel within the UK and Europe by freezing rates for short haul flights. This will benefit consumers who choose to fly domestically and to the continent over other forms of travel, but it will not um, cause a dramatic um, shift in consumer behaviour to the detriment of the environment. I will close by reiterating the point that has been made already. By not voting this legislation through today, Scotland would not benefit from tax collected on air travel. That is a situation that nobody desires. Instead, we can reflect upon the opportunities that this devolved policy presents while thinking carefully about how we use these new powers to open up air travel to Scotland. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. While supporting this bill, uh, I want to highlight today some policy points. The priority that the, the SNP government today are placing on this tax cut is very perplexing. It is not progressive. Uh, 2015 UK passenger data shows that 15% of the population takes 70% of the flights. And the Office of National Statistics analysis suggested a 50% cut uh, tax cut would benefit top earners significantly more than anyone else. It is not necessary. Scottish airports are enjoying record passenger numbers and overseas trips to Scotland are up by 6% in 2016, supporting our thriving tourist industry. It is not clear either. Once again, this Parliament is expected to scrutinise effectively without the full picture from the government. And I echo the concerns raised by the Chartered Institute of Taxation Scotland. 
In the absence, they say, of information such as this, it is very difficult to say with any degree of certainty what benefits, if any, this change will make. And the Scottish Government should consider this repeated concern very seriously. It is also unjustified. Scotland faces a time of financial constraint, and this is a valuable source of revenue. And APD, as it now is, uh, to become a departure tax, was valued at over 270 million in 2015-16. And depriving the public purse of this income seems irrational when coupled with the cuts to public services. Our local services are being squeezed and our communities are suffering for it. Cheaper business class flights won't make Scotland any fairer. A strategy for air airline routes that is based on sustainability and connectivity is important to the growth of Scotland's economy. But here we are faced with a choice between making the new powers and using them to invest in our economy or introducing a tax cut that will favour the rich and launch a race to the bottom in taxes across the UK. The SNP's decisions here are very revealing. Not only is it a question of social justice, cutting APD would have the implications for climate justice as well. Climate change is one of the biggest issues facing every country in the world. It underscores our interdependence, and this stage three debate arrives a week after the Scottish Government proudly revealed its success in reducing climate emissions this, uh, in, the, in the last tranche. And this chamber was filled with warm words and talk of ambition. The bad news, of course, was that the transport sector has now risen to be the heaviest greenhouse gas emitter. And our transport sector, including international aviation and shipping, has only dropped its emissions by 1.1% in 27 years. International aviation has increased by 9% from 2014 to 15, and from 1990 to 2015, it has risen dramatically by approximately 144%. Today, the SNP's talk of climate ambition could not seem more hollow. In 2015, the UK promised to be part of the collective action for the, for the Paris Agreement. This means the government needs to ensure that every policy is stress-tested to advance in Scotland our eventual determination to move towards a zero emissions economy. And has the Scottish Government really adequately recognise the need to compensate for this, uh, these additional emissions in our climate change plan? I'm not sure. Given the greenhouse gas emissions inventory for 2015, it is clear as day that we need a proper commitment to sustainable travel. Our, our, our transport sector, excluding international aviation and shipping, is now more damaging to our climate than it was in, in 1990. We need a focus on modal shift, improving public transport and infrastructure for more environmentally sustainable, uh, sustainable modes, to make it an easy choice for passengers. Incentivising people to fly, particularly domestically, is backwards. It threatens our rail services, which are not afforded the same tax breaks. It goes against Scottish Government's own key objective of bolstering rail services between Scotland and England. We support a continued exemption for the Highlands and Islands, remote and island areas where air travel can often be the only realistic option and hope the notification of the European Commission is successful. But how can the Scottish Government justify Must economically, end, socially and environmentally freezing budgets for, for bus services and active travel while giving aviation a free pass? Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This debate is, as it has been throughout the process, characterised by a number of contradictions. The advocates of the Scottish Government's position look at the rising levels of aviation that our airports continually trumpet and celebrate, and yet they say that the tax regime is holding the industry back. They say that cutting this tax in half and then abolishing it will not lead to damaging climate change emissions, but they say that it will lead to increased aviation levels. These things cannot be true. And at the heart of it, one single contradiction, the government is legislating to create a tax which the government itself thinks ought not to exist. I think there is good reason to have a specific tax on aviation. The government doesn't, and yet it's creating one. Bruce Crawford, in uh, what I have to say was an uncharacteristically grumpy contribution, I, I do hope his lunch was satisfactory today, he told, us, he told us that this 
bill should not be seen as being about the government's tax policy. But to create a tax, to legislate for a tax, in the absence of a clear sense from the government about what the purpose of that tax is, because the government itself wants to abolish the tax, I think is irresponsible. The consequences will be that Parliament will not be in a position to amend what comes forward from government when it introduces a, a resolution on rates and bans, on the structure of how this tax will be applied. We'll have to take it or leave it. And at that point, it'll be too late to leave it. The implication of passing a bill which does not constrain ministers, which of, of passing a bill which does not constrain ministers, essentially says that Parliament will accept what they come along with. Adam Tompkins. I'm grateful to the member for giving away. I just wonder if the member could explain that last comment. In what, in what sense will it be too late for this Parliament to reject uh, the government's proposed um, uh, rate resolution uh, when it comes to this Parliament for us to make a decision about it? That doesn't make sense. Patrick Harvey. We will be forced at some point to pass a resolution unless we want the tax to be levied at a zero rate. You know, the, the alternative to this bill passing is that the government still has ample time to introduce a bill which does have a sense of purpose within it, which does set clear duties on ministers, not just to have regard to certain factors, but to act in accordance with meeting the objectives that we've set ourselves whether on the national performance framework or on climate change. If we pass a bill that includes no such constraints, no such constraints, then Parliament will simply have to nod through, even if on a second go, we'll have to nod through what the government proposes. We will have handed too much power to government instead of to Parliament. And let's look at the consequences. Let's look at the consequences of that government policy, which they have clearly committed to in advance of having any evidence on the social, economic or environmental impacts. We know from the government, from the, the limited work the government has done, that it will increase aviation emissions. That, I think, is a given. And at a time when the Paris Agreement means that we should be increasing our scale of ambition on climate change rather than merely meeting those we've already legislated for, uh, this is not acceptable. We also know that it will have a socially unjust impact. As Neil Bebby mentioned, 70% of all flights are taken by just 15% of people. And most people in Scotland, most Scots, don't fly at all during any given year. Most people will be losers under this policy in any given year. And we also know that there is a clear uh, differential in income. In some of the research that we published just at the weekend, members can see by income distribution, the propensity of people on low and high incomes to be frequent flyers. We shouldn't be at all surprised at this. We shouldn't be at all surprised that the wealthiest people are the most frequent flyers and the poorest people stand to gain the least from this tax giveaway. Uh, and in terms of economic impacts, the government has produced nothing to justify its empty assertions. Uh, we could be achieving an economic benefit instead of cutting 300 million from aviation taxes, we could be using that resource to ensure that people have reliable, affordable and decent public transport in Scotland. That would benefit the, the, the economy, it would do it in a socially just way and it would reduce climate change emissions. The Greens will oppose this bill today because this is not the bill that we should be passing. We should be passing a bill that has clear, strong constraints on ministers and ensures that they act in accordance with the uh, social, economic and environmental objectives that all of us have said that we believe in. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Officer, can I start by thanking Bruce Cofford and his colleagues on the Finance and Constitution Committee, as well as all those who gave evidence uh, to that committee for their work in scrutinising this bill. And perhaps in response to Patrick Harvey's uh, comments there, I should also perhaps declare an interest as the MSP that probably spends more time sitting on aeroplanes uh, every given week with the obvious and jet lagged uh, exceptions of Tavish Scott and Alistair Allen. Uh, so I certainly understand uh, the case that is made for reducing taxis on certain types of air service, for example, as others have mentioned, routes serving Orkney and uh, other parts of the Highlands and Islands are already uh, currently exempt from APD on outbound journeys, though not for reasons I still uh, have yet to hear a convincing argument for on the inbound leg, an anomaly I uh, hope will uh, be addressed in due course. 
But that's a very different proposition, though, from that being argued by this government and by the Tory party in the context of this bill. The services I'm talking about are lifeline services, in some cases providing the essential link between NHS patients and the specialist treatment they rely upon. Even with uh, APD exemption, with the support of the discount scheme uh, introduced by my colleague Tavish Scott, these services are significantly more costly than those offered by the loudest advocates of this bill. So I see no contradiction in continuing to argue for a retention, if not an expansion, of the current APD exemption on lifeline services, while also questioning the economic, environmental and social justification for the kind of tax cut for the airline in industry recklessly being proposed by this government. In the brief time available, let me touch on those three aspects. Firstly, in relation to the economic rationale, as others have said, the Finance Committee concluded there simply is not the evidence to back up uh, the Minister's claim. The idea of having then scrapping uh, APD or ADT uh, seems to have been plucked out of thin air by the SNP, with none of the assumptions underlying it being challenged or the costs being accurately assessed. At a time when budgets across the board are under huge pressures, when we are hearing weekly of crises in education, in health, and transport, and a range of other key public services. We have an SNP government, with the support of the Tory party, proposing a gift to the airline industry, a tax, tax cut of up to £150 million a year. A down payment, indeed, for a tax cut twice that size somewhere down the line. Yet, with continued strong growth in the airline sector, as Neil Bibby, I think, quite rightly highlighted, how is it that SNP ministers have decided that this is the best use of scarce public resources. If the economic case is hard to stand up, the environmental justification is laid out cold. Last week, the government published figures showing that the transport sector needs to start pulling its weight if we are to meet our medium and long-term climate change targets. No progress so far in reducing emissions, and the SNP and Tory plans to slash ADT won't make turning around this any easier. I give way to Bruce Crawford. Bruce Crawford. Liam McArthur, given away. Listen, I've heard from Liam MacArthur about all the reasons why he doesn't want to cut the tax, but does that mean then, unlike at stage one, that this, on this occasion, the Liberals will be voting for this bill at the end of stage three, because otherwise your position is completely contradictory? Liam MacArthur. I don't see that that's the, the point at all. I think, as has been pointed out, there is an opportunity to bring forward a proper enabling bill that sets a structure within which in, any future decisions are, are taken. And passing a bad bill simply because um, the government insists that now uh, it needs to be passed is not a credible position either. The government seems to take comfort from the fact that the, uh, the only an additional 60,000 tonnes of CO2 will be pumped into our air each year. The notion that this is a mere nothing would be tenable if the UK Committee on Climate Change was advising us simply to slow the rate of growth in transport emissions. But they're not. They are explicitly and strenuously arguing for reductions to, um, to be delivered. Taken alongside the government's acceptance of a 27% growth in car usage, where in the transport sector do ministers expect emissions reductions to come from? Socially, too, these proposals fly in the face of what the government says it wants to achieve. The First Minister talks repeatedly about the need for sustainable economic growth and the case for greater equity. Yet this tax cut can hardly be described as either sustainable or progressive. When budgets and services are being squeezed and squeezed hard, this government's priority appears to be a tax break that will benefit least those who are least well off. Last-minute assurances that the economic, environmental and social concerns I have outlined will be addressed don't cut it. Have regard provisions in a vacuum are more loophole than safeguard. Deputy Presiding Officer, this bill is not supported by evidence, gives SNP ministers carte blanche and shows this government has the wrong priorities, preferring tax breaks for the airline industry over investment in education and health. And on that basis, Scottish Liberal Democrats will not be supporting this bill. I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thanks very much, President Officer. I welcome the chance to speak in the debate and I've enjoyed the contributions made by colleagues and witnesses as the bill will progress through the Finance Committee. Uh, reducing the travel tax on air passengers by 50% over the term of the Parliament will help Scotland to compete in more of a level playing field with other countries. It will boost international connectivity and it will help our national and local economies to grow. The UK's air passenger duty tax is the highest in the world in almost every category. For short haul flights, it's almost 50% higher than the next highest tax in place, which is in Greece. And for long-haul flights, it's more than double the next highest, which is in Germany. 
So for years, Scottish air passengers have been paying far in excess of their counterparts throughout the world. And I welcome the plans of the Scottish Government to address this and reduce the tax. When countries like Ireland abandoned their version of the tax in 2014, passenger numbers did grow in Dublin and also increased at the Irish regional airports too. Um, Jonathan Hinkles from Logan Air, when giving evidence to the committee, said there was, a clear, there was clear evidence that regional airports there benefited from the abolition of the tax. Whilst traffic grew in Dublin by about 40 per cent, there were flights serving Cork, Shannon and a host of other regional airports, bringing more people, more tourism and more revenue for those local economies as a result, all confirmed by the Managing Director of Dublin Airport, Vincent Harrison. Just to show how Scotland has been disadvantaged by this policy, Ireland, with a million fewer people than, than we have, sees about 28 million passengers coming through Dublin each year, plus increases throughout that country. Scotland, with its greater population, sees only 21 million passengers using Edinburgh and Glasgow combined. So this tax reduction gives both of our biggest cities a very real chance to grow and develop their, their economies to compete with other similar European cities. Uh, increasingly important, I think, to us as we enter the Brexit negotiations. This brings me neatly to Prestwick Airport in Ayrshire, presiding officer. Prestwick is a fantastic airport serving Scotland since the 1930s. It would stand to gain from the reduction in the tax as the Irish regional airports did. Indeed, Ryanair's Michael O'Leary, when asked at the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly in Dublin in March 14 about the prospect of the travel tax being removed in Scotland, said he could more than double the passengers coming through Prestwick if this tax was to be abolished. Only in September last year, Mr O'Leary again said that when scrapped, he could go from 5 million to 10 million passengers in two years. And only as recently as February, Ryanair again confirmed that they would bring more aircraft and more routes to Scotland, creating thousands of additional jobs. In terms of the CO2 emissions issue, the Government, as the Cabinet Secretary laid out, does recognise an increase in emissions will occur and is, a keen, is keen to work harder in other areas to help meet their targets. But we should remember, too, that aviation in Scotland accounts for only about 4% of our total emissions. No thanks. We should remember that aviation in Scotland accounts for only about 4% of our total emissions and the additional emissions as a result of this measure were described as manageable by the UK's committee on climate change. On jobs, the Edinburgh Airport study found that over five years with a 50% cut in place, we could be looking at an extra 3,800 jobs, 900,000 extra passengers and £200 million more coming into the Scottish economy. This would be a great benefit for Scotland and a huge spin-off for an airport like Presswick, with the aerospace industry already well established there, along with its important fog-free status, making it a strategic airport of some importance for Scotland, as it also bids to gain spaceport status. Presiding officer, the proposal to reduce and then eliminate this tax presents Scotland with a great economic opportunity, particularly as we'll soon know the real cost of Brexit, whilst maintaining our commitment to manage climate change emissions. I hope that the bill will be passed tonight and that all passengers in Scotland can look forward to a better deal from May Pro of next year. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This legislation is a completely logical step. Without it, there would be no tax on air travel payable from airports in Scotland from April 2018. In the earlier stages of the bill, the evidence heard from many interested parties, and particularly the airline industry, was that they wanted to see the mechanisms currently in place in the UK replicated as closely as possible in the initial term. As such, the bill is not dissimilar from the UK approach, with the only substantial difference being the new name. And thus, the Scottish Conservatives are, in general terms, supportive of the bill. Where it gets interesting, however, is in what the bill doesn't say. Last May, in their manifesto, the SNP said of air passenger duty, when the power to do so is devolved, we will reduce the overall burden of APD by 50%, with the reduction beginning in April 2018 and delivered in full by the end of the next Parliament. The Finance Secretary has been clear that he believes cutting air passenger duty will boost growth and the Scottish economy. And we think he's right that a properly targeted reduction on ADT will achieve that. 
But many in the stage one debate certainly struggled to get to that conclusion. And we can see why. On the 1st of March, the convener of the Finance Committee asked the Finance Secretary if the government had undertaken any economic assessment of the impact of a 50% cut in ADT. The Cabinet Secretary said, we have not commissioned any independent research of our own, but we have certainly looked at all the reports that have been provided. Now, of course, on the 21st of April, the Scottish Government commenced commissioning an independent economic analysis of its rate reduction plans to report in the autumn at the point when the government sets out the tax bans. Good. But I do find it deeply troubling that this is only being done at this very late stage. And to my surprise, and no doubt his consternation, I find myself agreeing with Patrick Harvey in the stage one debate, where he said, we should make policy on the basis of evidence, not scrounge around to see whether we can work up some evidence after we have adopted a policy. The lack of such an assessment allows opponents to deploy arguments, such as that cutting APD is wrong because such a reduction might benefit the wealthy, and that a reduction in ADT will automatically neg negatively impact the rail sector and the environment. Now, in response, I would argue that just because one sector of society, those it suits others to pejoratively deem the wealthy, might benefit, does not inexorably lead to a conclusion that it is a bad thing and should therefore be abandoned automatically. In particular, if we accept the argument that those who are wealthier fly, then aren't those exactly the sort of people we want to attract to Scotland, to invest, to spend, to stimulate local economies and create growth? I note that the fundamental premise of the, what we might call environmental damage argument accepts that reducing the tax increases the number of flights. And Bruce Crawford is right. This is vital economic activity. More flights, busier airports, more retail, more support services supplied locally, catering, cleaning, reception facilities, taxis, buses, baggage handlers. It means a greater local economic contribution from more tourists. And as for the modal shift from rail argument, it just doesn't fly in relation to long haul. <laughs> and the fact is, apologies for that. The fact is, many in the Northeast have little option but to fly if they need to make journeys to London or the Midlands. Whether train is an unrealistic alternative, we should encourage flying and see Scotland as more than just the central belt. According to others in this debate, by retaining the tax at full rate, those least able to afford it are being precluded from flying, perhaps on their dream holiday abroad. Those with less resources, those businesses with less, are forced to use a mode of transport that is not optimum for their requirements, or not go at all. The arguments against the consideration of any form of tax cut simply don't stack up. They appear to be based on a demonization of one demographic and fail to embrace the opportunities presented by this bill. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call James Kelly. I can give you up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, as we soar towards the end of this, uh, <laughs> this, this debate. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to close on behalf of the, the Scottish Labour Party and confirm that we will be uh, supporting the, the bill at uh, decision time tonight. We do so on the basis that we support the establishment of the, the ADT tax uh, in order that it can be used uh, positively. Um, however, uh, the, establishment, the establishment of that tax should not be used as a basis for introducing changes which will increase uh, carbon emissions. They should not, it should not be used as a basis to take money out of the Scottish budget. And there needs to be serious and critical analysis uh, of any policy change which benefits uh, flyers who are high earners, where well, some people in our communities don't have enough to afford a bus fare to the local job centre. So there are real questions that are going to have to be answered here. I think it's actually been quite an interesting debate. Um, you know, first of all, on the environmental consequences, you know, two excellent speeches from Claudia Beamish and also from Liam MacArthur. 
as Claudia Beamy says, any time, and she recalled the, the, the recent discussion, any time that climate change is discussed in this chamber, there are always you know, lots of warm words um, and people are very supportive of the, you know, the measures that are taken to reduce carbon emissions. But by the Scottish Government's own statistics, um, there's a potential here if we reduce ADT by 50%, that will result in f an increase in 50,000 extra tonnes of carbon emissions. So there are, there are consequences to this, this policy which don't uh, sit with the, 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 the policy objectives that have been announced in other uh, Scottish Government portfolios. I think Neil Bibby said some interesting questions when he uh, raised the issue about who would actually benefit from the introduction uh, of this tax and a reduction by 50%. You know, the, the, the top sort of 20% of earners, you know, would be £73 better off, uh, whereas the bottom 20% only, only £4.50 better off. I think there's a, a real issue around the fairness of this. And you saw that the, the government, in a sense, have not been able to tackle this part of the argument. You saw it in the intervention that Patrick Harvey made to Derek Mackay about the consequences on the Scottish budget. Um, where essentially the government's approach seems to be, you know, let's just look away now and we'll, we'll deal with it later. What I find really interesting about the debate is that uh, it's the Tories that have actually advanced the arguments for the reduction of AT, ADT rather than the SNP. I mean, Liam uh, Kerr, you know, actually kind of gave the game away in his speech, you know, and he said, well, effectively he was saying, you know, what's wrong with helping the wealthy? What's wrong with these cuts in, in ADT? You know, if there are wealthy people that benefit, then, you know, so be it. Um, you know, and that's the logic of the position, and that's got to be the challenge to, the S to those in the SNP benches that, you know, uh, try to portray themselves as the, the voice of, you know, progressives in Scottish politics. The reality here is that you are going to be signing up to a reduction uh, by 50% in ADT, which will take £189 million out of the Scottish budget. The Tories are, you know, are quite supportive of that approach uh, because their position is, you know, let's help these wealthy flyers and that will therefore you know, have an overall positive impact on the economy. But if that then means that we've got less teachers in our schools, yeah. that we've got less nurses in our NHS, so be it, is the attitude of the Tories. And the challenge to the SNP has got to be, is that, is that what you're signing up to? Is that what you accept? So, in summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, Scottish Labour will support the setting up of this tax, but we will robustly challenge any proposals which raise carbon emissions, that take money out of the Scottish budget and aren't fair and proportionate in terms of the impact on our communities throughout Scotland. I call Adam Tompkins around five minutes, please, Mr. Thank Tompkins. you, Presiding Officer. Um, in my uh, five minutes, let me just say three quick things. Why we support the bill, uh, why we support the government's amendments at stage uh, two, and why they're very important, um, and something about um, uh, the policy that we've heard uh, so many SNP uh, members say this afternoon about the importance of cutting taxation in order to grow the economy. We support the bill, first and foremost, because we believe on these benches in fiscal devolution for this parliament. We pushed hard for it uh, in the Smith Commission, um, and we very strongly support it, uh, the view that the Smith Commission took uh, that um, uh, uh, taxation on aviation was one of those taxes that should be devolved in full uh, to uh, this Parliament. Um, the Smith Commission said uh, that the power to charge tax on air passengers leaving Scottish airports will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. And the really important word there is Parliament, will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, not devolved to the Scottish Government. And this was the flaw, and it was a very serious flaw, presiding officer, in the bill uh, as introduced um, uh, earlier on in this session, because this bill, almost unique in British tax legislation, failed to define on, in the scope of the legislation the activity or behaviour that is to be taxed. And it's perfectly normal for bans and rates of taxation to be determined by secondary instrument uh, later on in the process, but it's very unusual, and it should be absolutely discouraged, for the scope of tax liability itself, 
not to be transparent on the face of legislation which is introducing that tax uh, in the first place. And the convener of the Finance and Constitution Com Committee, Bruce Crawford, mentioned this uh, in his remarks a, a few moments ago, but failed to mention, of course, that he and his SNP colleagues voted against the recommendations of the Finance Committee that the bill should be amended at stage two to remedy this serious defect. We were non nonetheless able to uh, prevail upon the Cabinet Secretary that we were right and that the convener and his colleagues were wrong uh, because, of course, the SNP don't have a majority uh, on that committee anymore, uh, do they? Yeah. Andy Whiteman. I thank the member for taking intervention. Can he explain why he didn't bring forward amendments at stage three to that effect? Adam Tompkins. He didn't need to because the bill was amended at stage two in amendments that we supported uh, uh, in the Finance Committee at, at stage two. So the bill now has remedied those uh, defects that were identified by us uh, in the early stages of the legislation. This is a defect which we didn't have in the LBTT legislation. It's a defect that we didn't have in the landfill tax legislation. It's a defect which isn't there in the uh, current UK APD, a passenger duty uh, legislation, and I think it's a pity uh, that the SNP uh, sought to introduce um, uh, such defective legislation into this Parliament, and indeed that the defects were supported by all of the SNP members on the Finance Committee uh, earlier uh, on. It's been a real pleasure in this debate, um, presiding officer, to listen to all of the SNP members talking about the importance of cat cutting tax uh, to grow the economy. Yeah. The question, however, that I would have yeah, yeah for those SNP members is why, in their view, is this an argument which pertains only to this tax? If cutting APD is good to grow the Scottish economy, and I wholeheartedly agree with the Cabinet Secretary that it is and that it will be and that we should get on with it and do it quickly, then why is the argument not also that, we, that cutting taxation more generally across the Scottish economy will be good for the Scottish economy because it will grow the Scottish economy? I, I know that Labour members won't understand the argument because Labour members have manifested time and time again this afternoon their complete inability to under, understand taxation. You cannot redistribute wealth within the economy unless you first create wealth in the economy. And the argument here is not about redistribution and fairness, it's an argument about creating wealth in the first place. Uh, we propose, presiding officer, to remove the air travel tax on flights longer than 2,000 miles. This will incentivise airlines to provide new direct links from Scotland to America, to China, and to other global destinations, which is important, which would be important in the Scottish economy with or without Brexit, so that families and businesses do not have to travel via London's packed airports or via Amsterdam or other hub airports uh, in Europe. And we hope that the uh, Cabinet Secretary will bring forward proposals that are based on these uh, policies. We support an immediate um, freeze on air passenger duty or um, uh, air departure tax on short-haul flights to the UK and Europe in order to ensure passengers can also enjoy cheaper fares to destinations nearer to home. This is part of our economic strategy um, ahead of Brexit, which is focused on ensuring, get, uh, on ensuring that Scotland gets connected to the global uh, economy. International evidence for all of the wailing to the contrary from the Greens and others, international evidence does support the existence of a link between air travel, air travel demand and departure tax rates. In the Netherlands, for example, a departure tax was introduced in 2008, only to be scrapped two years later following dropping passenger and tourist numbers. And closer to home in Ireland, the Irish government abolished its travel tax in April 2014, and annual airport traffic rose the next year by 3.3% million customers. And, but the gap between Ireland and Scotland with regard to long-haul flights is obvious. In 2015, presiding officer, there were around 470,000 passengers travelling to or from the United States and Scotland, while in Ireland that number is over 2.5 million. So we support the bill and we support the government's underlying policy behind the bill of cutting this tax, not because we think this is the only tax in Scotland that should be cut in order to grow the economy, but because we believe in the underlying principle of cutting taxation in order to grow the economy, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary now sees the wisdom of that. Thank you. I now call Derek Mackay to close this debate. If you could take us up to 5.15, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In my notes, I had said, considering some of the controversy around this policy, it has been quite a constructive and consensual debate. And then Adam <laughs> Tompkins uh, contributed to bait pretty much every other party uh, in uh, the chamber, with the exception of, of the Liberal Democrats. Uh, sticking with the Tories for just, just a moment, Liam Kerr made the point about policies based 
uh, in evidence, but didn't mention Brexit, maybe that's no surprise, because if only there was more evidence taken into account in that particular subject, I think we'd all be in a better uh, position. But Liam Kerr didn't say the words, I agree with Derek Mackay. The most interesting contribution from Liam Kerr was to say he agrees with Patrick Harvey uh, on uh, matters in relation to this bill. In terms of Murdo Fraser, I know that that surprised many Conservatives that have just joined uh, the Chamber, but James Kelly is right to say that if we don't establish this bill, we won't be collecting any tax at all. So it is right to create the legislation that gives us the framework to enable us to be able to collect the tax, of course, will return to the tax decisions on that affirmative order, which is transparent and will be considered in a proactive way uh, by Parliament. Now, I have tried to engage uh, on the structure of the tax, respond to the consultation, and I recognise the issue that has been raised by a, a number of members over the course uh, of the debate, and including uh, Liam MacArthur on the issue of the Highlands and Islands exemption, which is a significant issue. As Transport uh, Minister, I was able to propose uh, the increase of the air discount scheme subsidy to 50%. So I'm well aware of the issues in the Highlands and Islands around aviation as a form of, of transport and its uh, critical importance to those residents in those communities. And I say again that I'm engaging with the UK Government to resolve this matter. And I have a further call with the, the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury where I'll raise this and other matters to progress the issue of a like-for-like -like exemption for the Highlands and Islands. That's the aspiration of the Scottish Government. But this tax is one of the most expensive of its kind in Europe and the world. And that's why it's right to try and deliver a level playing field to sustain what we have in Scotland and establish new routes because we know that the industry and the airports are a dynamo to the Scottish economy and we could do more uh, with the powers that are coming our way and we'll do it in a transparent way in a fashion that I've set out over the course uh, of the debate. Uh, Neil Bibby criticised the airline industry but at the same time welcomed airport growth. Hardly surprising if you look at the region uh, that Neil Bibby represents and is interested in terms of welcoming airport growth, which is a surprise why he would criticise the airline industry, considering the jobs that are so important uh, in that uh, area. But we intend to meet, in terms of climate change, our climate targets. This government has a strong track record uh, of doing so, and we intend to meet our climate uh, our emission reduction targets and take this into account, take this policy and this modelling into account uh, as we do that. That's why we will publish. Yes, I will. Patrick Harvey. Grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way again. His position would be more credible if the government's own climate change plan set out very clearly how much they intend to allow aviation emissions to rise, either as a result of this policy or background uh, levels of growth, and what actions they intend to take to compensate for those increased emissions. When will we hear any shred of detail about what the government intends to do as a result of its measures to increase aviation emission growth? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government has said and has reported that our advisers, the UK Committee on Climate Change, has said that these, uh, the modelling is manageable, that any increase in aviation emissions is manageable as part of that overall policy. And yes, we've acknowledged that it means we have to work harder in other areas to do that. But we have, we have a track record in delivering on this area and will continue to do so whilst delivering on our commitments around boosting sustainable economic growth. Now, this legislation today is about fulfilment of devolution, about the completion of new fiscal powers, about the structure of tax. And yes, and taking into account the recommendations of committee, the exemptions and other matters as well. But further than that, the commitments that I've outlined in terms of publishing analysis eh, and uh, assessments in a constructive fashion. But Bruce Crawford eh, is right. We want to show that Scotland is open for business, 
This fits within our economic strategy. It is about internationalisation uh, and it is about uh, supporting uh, business and tourism and growth in Scotland in a responsible way. And that's why we'll use our fiscal powers uh, in a responsible way, as outlined over the course uh, of this debate. So I say today it is about establishing the enabling power, being able to come back with the affirmative order to set the tax rates and bans where there will be further uh, engagement. And I therefore invite the Parliament to approve the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. Thank you. That concludes our stage three debate on the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. We'll move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 5202 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the seat belts on school transport Scotland Bill. I call on Derek Mackay to speak to and move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. The question will be put at decision time. And there are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is on the motion to pass the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. And following the new procedures that we have introduced uh, relating to protected subject matter, under Rule 9.8.9, .9, I am required to call a division on the motion to pass the bill at Stage 3. And this is because even though I have decided that a supermajority is not required, we are required to record the result so that we can demonstrate in any circumstances the number of members who voted in favour of the bill. So I hope you follow that. I will now move immediately to the vote. The question is that motion 6164 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill at Stage 3 be agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 6164 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 108, no 11, there were no abstentions, the motion is therefore agreed and the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill is passed. And the final question this evening is that motion 5202 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the seat belts on school transport bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Linda Fabiani on the Scottish Civic Trust. We'll just take a few moments for members to change their seats.